What if you didn't have to 3D print in layers anymore, but could make an entire object appear instantly, seemingly out of nowhere, in one solid piece? This machine does exactly that. I met with a group of researchers at Open Source from Berkeley that claimed that they made a 3D printer that prints the entire object almost instantly. No layers, no supports. Just a final 3D structure printed all at once. This method of printing is called computed axial lithography. First, you take a vial of resin and set it in a machine that rotates the vial at a specific rate. Then a light turns on and shines an image at the vial. And after about 30 seconds, you take the resin and dump it out. Okay. Okay, so this is the finished product here. It's a little robot. All we took, how long did this take? Like 30 seconds? 30 seconds. Yeah. And almost like magic, there's a perfect 3D printed piece. In this case, it's a little robot. So you can make anything you can make with a standard 3D printer, but because the printer doesn't rely on layers or nozzles or supports, you can also do things that normal 3D printers can't do. For example, you can do something called overprinting, where you form a 3D structure over an already existing structure, like putting a screwdriver handle on this bit. And even cooler than this is you can print things microscopically small. These are tiny structures that are almost invisible to the naked eye. They were 3D printed in the same way. No layers, but the whole volume printed all at once. Today I'm going to show you the amazing process that turns a 2D flat image of light into a 3D structure. To understand how this works, first we have to get a CT scan. In a CT scan, a patient enters a big machine. This machine then shoots x-rays through your body. On the opposite end of every x-ray source is a detector that detects the intensity of the x-rays after it's passed through the body. This data is then used to construct a 2D slice of your body. So by shining light rays, in this case x-rays, at different angles, the machine reconstructs a 2D image or a slice. These slices can then be added together to reconstruct a total 3D image of the inside of your body. The method to get an image based on shining light at different angles is called tomographic reconstruction. For example, let's say that you're imaging this pi symbol here using these light rays and measuring how their intensity changes as it goes through the pi symbol. The red graph shows the data you would receive at each angle for each ray of light. So even though you're only getting one dimensional data, this data contains information about depth based on its intensity. You know, if it's less intense, then it went through more material. So if you add all these graphs together, you get how the intensity changes at all the angles. But now here's the key. Let's say now you have some photo paper that turns white when light hits it. The more light that hits it, the whiter it turns. So now you can just reverse the process and shine rays of light that mimic the attenuation graphs you got earlier at every angle. When you do this, you end up with the original picture of the pi symbol. So by varying the intensity of light at different angles, we can create complex images. For example, let's say I have a beam of light shining on this surface. This tape will represent my beam of light. Then when I spin it, it will make a disc. For us right now, the reason we can see a disc is because this is the part that has enough light for us to see it. Outside of here, even though the tape is still there, it's only there periodically, so it's not as much light as the center. So this is where it would hit a critical value for it to make a disc. If I have two beams of light separated by a gap, then I can make a disc with a hole in it. So this makes like a washer shape. So I can make simple geometries without even varying the intensity of the beams, but just by rotating it. But if you're able to rotate the light source and vary the brightness as you rotate it, then you can make complex geometries like the pi symbol here. So we know that light can be used to make these 2D images, but how do we make them into a 3D structure? Well, to make a 2D image, we're shining a linear array of lights, a one-dimensional array of lights. So if we shine a 2D array of lights, we should be able to make a 3D image. But the only problem is we need a three-dimensional photo paper. And that's where this stuff comes into play. This is a special resin that hardens when it's exposed to a certain amount of light. Below a certain intensity of light, nothing happens. But once you hit a critical value, then it hardens. So these printers have a projector that shines a 2D array of light at the resin as it spins. It's literally just a projector projecting a special image onto the resin. The image it projects kind of looks like a ghostly image of the final 3D structure. The projected image rotates along with the vial. 
The image that it projects is created by performing tomographic reconstruction of all the 2D slices of the 3D file. And although I just explained how it's working, it still seems like magic when a final 3D structure emerges from the resin. So the file is still built on 2D slices of the 3D model, but all the slices are printed at the same time. The entire volume is formed at once. Now if you have a resin printer, some of this information may have struck a chord with you. You may have noticed that I talked about the resin as if it were some new invention, but regular resin printers also make 3D prints that are formed when light reacts with the resin to harden it. But it does it layer by layer by moving the piece right against the surface, which shines a light that makes that layer harden. So could we use regular resin to make a 3D object using volumetric printing? Well, let's try it and see if it works. Let's see if I can make a sphere by rotating a vial of resin in front of my UV flashlight. If I have a circular beam of light, that should in the end make a spherical shape. But before we continue, another application of light that I want to talk about is detection. That's why I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Reolink. This is the Reolink Elite Floodlight Wi-Fi, a security floodlight and camera system designed for outdoor monitoring. It uses two floodlights that are adjustable up to 3000 lumens, and the color temperature can be set anywhere between 3000K for a warmer tone and 6000K for a cooler, brighter light. You can keep the light on continuously or have it turn on automatically from dusk to dawn, or you can have it activate only when it detects people, vehicles, or animals. The camera itself has a 180 degree field of view with no blind spots, and it records in 4K, so the image quality is really sharp, with the ability to zoom in on details as well. Even when the lights aren't on, it's still recording with its IR camera. It also includes smart detection features like setting a virtual line or zone. The system can send alerts when something crosses into these areas or stays there for a certain period of time. There's also a feature called AI Video Search, which allows you to search recorded footage by keywording, making it easier to find specific events. What's nice is the search runs locally for privacy and doesn't require a subscription. This can be controlled through the Reolink app, where you can adjust settings, view live video, and receive notifications. Everything, including the lighting and motion detection settings, can be managed from the app. I've been using Reolink's app to monitor my home for a long time now, and it's insanely easy to control everything from my phone. So if you want nighttime security that feels like it's daytime, this is it. So if you want to try out the Reolink's new Elite Floodlight Wi-Fi camera, you can click the link in the description. And thanks for Reolink for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to our experiment. Okay, let's turn the vial and then turn on the light and see if it forms a ball at the center. Okay, I feel like it's changing, but it might be just around the edges. Okay, it's been about three minutes. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, it's hot. So it looks like it just made a ring around the outside. See if that's what it actually is. Oh man. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so that's what it made. So I'm pretty sure my light was too big here. It took up basically the width of the whole vial. I need the light to be smaller than the vial. So I'm gonna use a violet laser. The resin cures at ultraviolet wavelengths, but I think that it'll get into the violet wavelengths as well. So this violet laser should still work. See if a sphere shows up right in the center now. Okay, so the same thing happened. Even though the light was only focused on the center, it was dragging along the edges, so it made this ring again. So why did this happen? How can their printer make a sphere when they do this, but mine just makes a ring around the edge? Well, in talking with Taylor Waddell, one of the scientists working at Berkeley, he told me it's all in the resin. Regular resin like the ones in SLA printers have additives in them that block the wavelengths of light that make them react or harden. This is done on purpose because you only want a very thin layer of resin to react when your plate comes down and the light turns on at the bottom. So you can see how the resin absorbs the light when I put it on this white plastic here. You can see how bright the violet laser is on here, but when I put it on the transparent resin, it doesn't reach the bottom. So it's getting absorbed by the resin. So it hardened this top piece here. Another reason this didn't work is because the resin reacts at any light level hitting it. So even if the inhibitors weren't in the resin, it would have just turned into a solid block, 
because ultimately light's hitting everywhere in the resin a little bit. So in order for this volumetric printing to work, you need the resin to reach a threshold value before it reacts. So in the special resin used in these printers, light will react with the molecules in the resin, and if these reactive species bump into each other, it'll start forming chains. But oxygen in the resin also reacts with the activated species and can deactivate it. So the only way you can get the polymer to actually form is if there's enough light so that it reacts faster than the oxygen can deplete it. So if you have a little light, nothing happens. But once you hit a critical value, then it will harden. So this gives you the ability to have very fine edges and shapes where the light hits just above the critical value to give you a solid. And everywhere else, you don't get a solid. In fact, you can even reuse the unhardened resin afterwards. These printers are honestly so cool. I hope to see them become more accessible to the general public in the near future, especially because you can do certain things with these printers that can't be done with traditional printers. So thanks to the team at Berkeley for letting me showcase their cool technology. They're actually trying to make these printers more available to the public by making them open source. So if you want to check it out, I'll put a link to their Discord in the description. And thanks for watching another episode of The Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.